Oh, well, isn't that nice? Nice to be wanted. You know, when you get older, you know, uh, sometimes uh, people don't want you anymore. They think you're too old. Uh, but some of the great characters of the Bible were quite ancient and still doing great things for God. And, uh, you know, when, 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 when you face reality, it's not my fault I'm 82 or whatever it is I am. I can't, I can't remember now whether I'm 82 or 81 or I know I'm in my 80s. And as long as I know that much, I know I'm not insane. <laughs> I know I'm not 70 and I'm not 60 and I'm not 20 anymore. But I am about 82. You can work it out for yourself. I was born on the 22nd of April in 1922. Now somebody can tell me how old I am. Because I can't be bothered working it out. You've got it already. 82. You're very clever. It's taken me uh, half a year now to work that out. I'm 82, am I? Very good. I thought I was 82. No, I don't look it. Oh, that's very encouraging. Yeah, not 80. I don't look 82. Well, I suppose sometimes I don't feel it. Other times I do feel it, you know. Uh, but uh, life is wonderful, you know. Life is very exciting. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're 82 or 22. Is there anybody here 22? You're telling an untruth. Are you 22? Oh, I thought you would have looked 23. <laughs> but you're 22. Well, that's wonderful, isn't it? Well, we've got one 22-year-old. Anybody younger than that? Of course there is. Look at that. Oh, look, quite a number. Oh, look at that. You've got a young church here on your hands, uh, which is very wonderful. But anyhow, is anybody as old as I am? Older? You mean I'm the oldest thing here? <laughs> well, take a look at me. How am, I, how am I doing for 82? Not bad. I haven't got so much hair as I used to have. And uh, I don't dye my hair. I never have. I don't know what color it is now. What color is my hair, would you say? What color is it, do you think? Very Jewish gray. Jewish gray. Oh, I thought you said a Jewish grey. I wonder what a Jewish grey was like. A distinguished grey, did you say? Ah, well, there you go. Isn't that marvellous? Distinguished grey. If I was giving out medals, I'd give you a gold one. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, isn't it exciting, though? I'm glad of, you know, see young Ben here this morning uh, growing up. And uh, it won't be too long before he'll be bigger than his father and wiser than his father and more anointed at his father because God moves in generations. And my my son Brian is doing great things for God, you know. And uh, then I've got a, a daughter, Judith. And uh, and Judith, my daughter, she's doing great things for God. She's married to a great preacher and doing great things in the kingdom of God. And it's wonderful, that, isn't it? You know, your sons and your daughters and uh, serving the Lord with gladness. Uh, uh, do you want to come down and to the, it's not right to that. Because I like, you know, you know I don't know, never know what they're going to do behind my back. <laughs> you know, they're very well behaved. And uh, it's lovely, lovely to be here again. I, this is not the first time I've been in this church. I don't know. I've been here quite a bit over the years and uh, preached here. Uh, but like I said, it's not my fault. Uh, I'm in my 80s. And uh, <clears throat> last uh, May, on, uh, on the, uh, the 30th of May, I think it was, uh, uh, my wife went to be with the Lord, as you probably know. And that, I suppose, was, uh, you know, one of those, it was not one of, it was the saddest day of my life. Uh, I mourned when my mother died, and when my father died, and when my older sister uh, went to be with the Lord. But when Hazel, my lovely Hazel, you know, I loved her, and I still love her too. Uh, and uh, she just suddenly, in church, I thought she worked it well. Fancy going to be with the Lord in church. And uh, Sunday morning, on the uh, last Sunday in May, you know, uh, my wife got up that morning, and she looked fit and well. The day before, uh, she had driven the car, and we drove way out in the country. Lovely, uh, sunny day in, in the middle of winter. And, uh, and I said, let's go out into the country today on a Saturday, last last day of May, and out into the country. She drove all the way there and all the way back. Many miles we drove that day, all day, just driving, calling in in cafes and having a cup of coffee and so forth and so on. 
and she had uh, no signs. She never even told me that the next day she was going to go to be with the Lord. Isn't it terrible that she never told me? <laughs> and, uh, and anyhow, uh, the next morning we went to church. We always went to church. We've been going to church together uh, for years and years and years and years and years. But, you know, she chose a wonderful place to go to the Lord. She went to the Lord in church. Isn't that wonderful? And, uh, and so the ambulance came. We called an ambulance. And guess what? Two ambulances came. Just like Hazel. One wasn't good enough. <laughs> and, and, and so two ambulances came to the church. And, uh, well, it weren't, actually wasn't at the church. It was near, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a restaurant just near the church. And, uh, and there was my dear beloved Hazel laying out in, in, in a, on the floor of, of a cafe. And uh, that was the last time she ever spoke to me. And she went to be with the Lord. Well, that's all right. I, you know, I had my, my weeping and, uh, and my wailing and the gnashing of my teeth, so to speak, you know. I was terribly sad. Imagine being married to, uh, to a beautiful woman like Hazel all those many years. I think it was about 165 years or something like that. That's what it seemed like. And she went to be with the Lord. Well, that was all right. She went to be with Jesus. That's where she is now. Uh, and um, I don't know if any of you went to Hazel's funeral, but what a wonderful funeral she had. Church was packed, overflowing, They're outside, all around the veranda outside. You were there. And wasn't that a wonderful funeral? I thought, boy, I hope they give me a funeral like that. And, uh, you know, and, and the coffin was a nice coffin. And it cost a fortune. <laughs> Still paying for the blooming thing. You know, and, and, and that... But, you know, the serious thing about it was, as long as I knew Hazel, she was a born-again, spirit-filled Christian when I first met her. And the very first kiss that I gave her when I fell in love with her was so anointed that my mouth frothed for a month afterwards. <laughs> you know, it was incredible. Uh, uh, but, you know, we were in love with each other. And I only have had one wife, and that was Hazel. And of course, as you know, in the last day of May, um, she, we were in McDonald's restaurant. The only thing I'm going to say to Hazel when I do meet her in heaven, you might have chosen a more expensive restaurant to die in than McDonald's. But she has the honor of being the only lady, and I, I asked the, the manager of McDonald's, and McDonald's, and by the way, the staff of McDonald's, and the manager of McDonald's there uh, 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 near our church, that manager was so wonderful to us. He even came to the funeral. The manager of McDonald came to Hazel's funeral. So wonderful to us and so kind to us. And uh, he was uh, tremendously impressed with, uh, with um, the church and so on and, and, and so on. See, God works everything out. I want you to know in your heart today, Nothing happens in your life. If you're a believer, you've got Jesus in your heart. Nothing happens by chance. Come on. Come on. Get excited. Nothing happens by chance. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, I had my time of uh, weeping when Hazel left me uh, and that. But I also had my time of rejoicing. I thought how terrible it must be for a man to lose his wife, if you weren't a Christian and didn't know the love of God and didn't know how wonderful God is. And, uh, you know, I don't think, I don't think in terms of Hazel dying so much as I think in terms of the Lord taking Hazel home to glory where she really belonged, you know. And all of my, all of her life, when I first met her, the very first time I saw her, she was a radiant Christian, a young person, very healthy, very athletic. She used to win all the church races for women. Uh, when we uh, had the days, that I don't know if you still have church picnics or, or things like that. We, we don't have all those things that we used to have when we were younger. But uh, she was a very athletic person. She was a great cyclist. She used to cycle for miles and miles and miles. I was a young man and she would exhaust me. Uh, you know, uh, on, on bike rides. Some days we'd sit out early in the morning. Once we set out at 4 o'clock in the morning to 
gone on a cycle. I recycled all day, all day. And then she forgot that the distance you travel out, you've got to travel back, you know. And so there we were staggering home towards midnight, me exhausted, and Hazel flopping into bed like a dead horse and awaking at a normal time of five o'clock in the morning as though nothing had happened. You know, wonderful. Anyhow, Hazel, the other day, the, the last Sunday in May, uh, she went to be with the Lord. And when I began to think about it, and I got a little bit past uh, my grief and so on, I thought, you know, that's exactly the way Hazel would love to have gone, to be with the Lord, just without any warning, without any time to say goodbye, nothing, just... The only grievance I have is that she didn't choose a beautiful, expensive restaurant to die in, rather than time. But she did have the honour of being the first person in all of Australia, in all of McDonald's, because I found out from the manager, they could not find a McDonald's anywhere where anybody had died. <laughs> so that's just like I thought. She had to have the honor of being the first person to go to heaven in McDonald's restaurant. Wasn't that nice? <laughs> Certainly better than nothing. But I tell you, what a wonderful joy it is to be in church this morning. Yeah. Don't you feel that it's a pity that the whole of this area weren't in churches this morning? Everybody in the house of God. People don't know what they're missing. The wonderful joy of knowing Jesus. The wonderful joy of experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, you know. And uh, people say to me now, and of course Hazel went to be with the Lord uh, uh, about the last uh, Sunday, it was, I think, in May. And uh, how many months is that? That's about three or four months, isn't it? And, uh, and so on. And so I think everybody thought, poor old Frank, that'll be the end of him, you know, because Hazel was absolutely everything to him. Well, you know, uh, these folk uh, were at Hazel's funeral. She had a, you were there, weren't you? Yeah. And she had a wonderful funeral, marvelous, triumphant funeral. Hundreds of people there. In fact, the church was packed, the big church down there was packed they were out on the veranda outside. Everybody she had a marvelous send-off and a great funeral. And uh, right in winter, and there wasn't a cloud in the sky, there wasn't a breath of wind, and everything was just absolutely the way that I thought it should be. But that's the way life is, and that's the way death should be for those of us who believe in Jesus. And now I've got some deposit in heaven. My little mother was a great Baptist, and she was an amazing Christian, bright little lady. And uh, she, uh, she used to trot me and my brother uh, and my sister uh, off to the Baptist church that was nearly five miles away from where we lived. And every Sunday morning, we would set off for church, walking. No cars in those days, only a few wealthy people had cars. And uh, the cars they had were all square boxes, you know, on wheels and, and, and so on. That's how far back it was when I was a boy, because you've got to remember that I'm uh, in my 80s, so it's a long time ago. And, uh, you know, we'd go, off to, <coughs> we'd go off to church on, uh, on, uh, on Sunday morning, walk all the way, five miles. And then we'd have church, and then when church was over, everybody would, uh, would uh, speak to everybody, and then we'd set off for home, sometimes, there were one or two, there weren't many cars in those days, but uh, some people had a car. Every now and then, somebody would give us a ride home, but not often. Mm -hmm. And we'd walk home. Now, you're not going to believe this. But then at night, my mother and me and my brother and my sisters, two sisters, we'd set off again and walk back to the Baptist church, the little Baptist church, and off we go. Every now and then, no, not many people had motor cars, but every now and then, one of the great men in the church would give us a ride home. But often, he wasn't there. And so we'd walk all the way home again at night. Absolutely. <laughs> and that was church. 
That was Sunday. But, you know, looking back on it, how wonderful that all was. And the fun that we had with our mother. I got to know my mother so well. And a lot of it was just walking everywhere because we had no motor car and hardly anybody else you had a motor car either. Only a few wealthy people had cars. And they were just square boxes on wheels, sort of, so to speak, you know. And uh, that's the way back in those days. But I'll tell you something. There was something about those days that's sadly lacking in society today. Something lacking. Uh, people had great friendships and great relationships with, uh, with the neighbours and with uh, relatives and so forth. And we used to often look forward to a Sunday afternoon when, uh, when uh, one of our uncles would come in his flash car, whole square box on wheels, but he'd come in his car on a Sunday afternoon. And we would hope and pray that uh, our uncle would say, come on, I'll give you a ride in the car, but not him. <laughs> not him, no. But anyhow, that's something of the old days. But you know, we didn't stay in the old days. We grew up into manhood, the sisters into womanhood, and so on. And uh, they went their way, got married, I got married, so on. And life went on. But here I am today, in my 80s, and uh, still, by the grace of God, say the grace of God, by the grace of God, I'm still vibrant on the inside. I'm still alive with the Holy Ghost on the inside. I still love Jesus with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. Who could take that from me? People were saying, uh, how will poor old Frank get on? without his wife. She was so much. Well, I can't tell you how much I miss her, but I want to tell you I'm doing very well. You know, I went the other day and bought myself a new pair of shoes. You know, and I've got new shoes on this morning. My feet are aching like mad, you know. Uh, but I've got some new shoes that are going to break in now. But, you know, see, life has to go on. See, life's got a purpose. So I started that man on the end of the row there, and I came down each of you people right through and came back uh, to the pastor and his wife here. Uh, you know, God's got a purpose for your life. And if I didn't say anything else this morning, that's an important thing to say. God has got a purpose for your life. See? You, and you, if I can, I haven't time to go through you all. And the little boy back there, two little boys, one bigger than the other. But God's got a purpose for their life. A couple of little kids up there, and a sweet little girl with a white ribbon, or is it pink? In my old age, I can't tell what color it is, but I think it's white. Is that white? And you hear, there you are, I'm not as blind as I thought I was. Hallelujah. And the lady back there with brown eyes. Oh, glory to God, isn't that amazing? Nothing wrong with my eyes. Now they've gone pink. You know, but you know, how, how wonderful it is, isn't it? You know, when you know Jesus, say, when I know Jesus. Now the question is, do you know him? When you know Jesus, that makes a big difference. Now, people were saying, poor old Frank, Hazel's gone to be with the Lord. Now, he's alone. But what they didn't realize, I wasn't alone at all. And, and, and if anything, Jesus uh, is uh, more precious to me than ever. And uh, so, what has happened? Well, my, these lovely folk here were at Hazel's funeral. She had an amazing funeral, a beautiful funeral, hundreds of people at her funeral and it was a great sunny day in the winter, not a cloud in the sky. And I thought, Lord, you've just ordered this all for Hazel. And, and, and so we, we, we buried Hazel, or her, her remains we buried. She was up in heaven probably looking on and, and, and rejoicing. Uh, but <clears throat> the wonderful thing about this is 
<coughs> the Bible says that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Say nothing. nothing. Now, when God says nothing, he means nothing. No thing. Nothing. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to say neither life nor death, principalities, powers, and it mentions death. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Well, here we are. My wife died uh, uh, on, the, on the 30th of May. Or whatever it was. How long ago was that? That was four or five months ago, you know. And uh, I, I never even asked Hazel, Hazel permission, and I bought myself a new pair of shoes. You know, a couple of days ago, my feet are hurting like mad here until I get them worn in. But friends, look at me today. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Absolutely nothing. Neither in it mentions it's neither death nor life, nor things present, nor things to come. No, and it goes through a whole list of stuff. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. The world could turn upside down today, and the Lord would have a parachute for every one of us, or wings, or something. See? Nothing can separate you. I want you girls and boys to hear this. You're very young, and you've got a great life that's coming, but you stick close to God. And then you'll get like me, and you'll live till you're 82 or 3 or whatever it is I am, I forget. But I tell you, God, down through the years, has kept me. And on the, uh, uh, on the 30th of May, the Lord suddenly took my wife, just like that. And you know where he took her from? In McDonald's restaurant. The only thing I've got to complain about was that she didn't go from a decent, proper, dignified expensive restaurant but she chose to go for McDonald's <laughs> and so that was it that was it now you know people thought oh that's the end of poor old Frank you know Hazel was so much to him and, and it's true Hazel was so much to me she was such a beautiful wife She's the only wife I ever had I never had a chance to to have another one you say what's the matter with you you're single now you could get married again no, once bitten, twice shy, you know. <laughs> not really, not really. But the point is, friends, I'm saying this to say this, saying that to say this, that, you know, when you are a believer in Christ and you've got Jesus ruling and reigning in your heart, nothing, say nothing. Now, when God says nothing, he means no thing, nothing can separate you from him. Your own folly can take you out of fellowship through backsliding. But nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, which is an amazing assurance to have in your heart. You know, and, and, and I want you to understand today that you're not in this world by chance. You're not just nothing, just another person amongst the five or six billion people that are on the on the, on, the, on the globe today. No. It's an amazing thing that there's all these millions and billions of people on the face of the earth. There's never been so many human beings on the earth at one time ever in all of history. And yet God knows every one of them. And it doesn't matter whether they're red in color like the Red Indians, yellow like some of the Asian races, ye red, yellow, black and white, we used to sing that old song. All are precious in his sight. Jesus died for all the children of the world. And uh, it's been my privilege in my lifetime to travel around the world preaching the gospel in many countries. Many countries. And I have actually preached to the red, the yellow, the black, and the white. You say, where were the red people? The red Indians in America. They have a red tinge in their, in their skin. And I preached to the Red Indians. I preached to the Maoris all over New Zealand uh, when I lived in that country and, and so on. And, and, and the big thing to know is that everybody is precious in the sight of Jesus. Not a, if I started with a pastor's wife and went through everybody here today and right away back 
down to you and the musicians have all gone to heaven and they've vanished. But, but, tell you what, but if I went to everyone, you are important to God. This uh, curly-headed little young man here, sitting here, uh, lounge, you need a lounge chair. That's not comfortable enough, is it? You know, it's not comfortable enough. You, you, you ought to get yourself, bring yourself a nice lounge chair to church. Fantastic. But what a fantastic young fellow he is. Curly hair, sort of, good looking. And it's not your fault you're good looking. So thank God you are. Who wants to be ugly when you can be good looking? Yeah. Look at this great big strong man, full of faith. I hope you love God all the days of your life, full of the Holy Ghost and be a man of God. You may preach the gospel one day, and uh, and then you have the great ability to preach the gospel, and the best pill there ever was, the gospel. Yes. Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful. Now, who's sick this morning? Anybody not well? All right. I'm, I'm going to pray for you that God will heal you. Only one sick person. Oh, we've got one or two. Oh, are you sick? Jesus, heal this man. You had a temperature. You need an aspro. God, heal this man. Jesus. Now, who else had the hand up? Ah, are you all right, love? Very sick? Got the flu? Oh. <laughs> Who else? Oh, is this all right to be here? Yes. Ah, who had the hand up? Yes. What sort of a sickness? What do you... Pain. Have you got arthritis or something? Pain. Pain. Oh, is it in your body? Have you got, do you have the flu or something like that? Do you always have this? Pardon? That's too long to have it, isn't it? Don't you think? You might have I should have banged into you there. What's your name, dear? Chris. Jesus. Thank you for the power of God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke this condition. Command the healing power of God to flow in Jesus' name. Receive it now into your heart. Thank you, Lord. Who else was it? Yes, what do you have love. Oh, yes. This one. Jesus, heal her. Heal her now. Jesus' name. Yes. There you go. Your knees. All right. Put your, put your hand on your knees. Jesus, I command these knees to be healed in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Is that arthritis? Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm, there's nothing. I'm in my 80s. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. Right. Yeah. That's a good idea. Okay, just let me finish with this. I'll just finish with this. Yeah. Jesus. In healing. Father, in the name of Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, hallelujah. Holy Ghost, come. Okay, can we just have it quiet for a moment? I just want to say some things and then you can sing just for a moment or two.
Now, now, <clears throat> don't let this just be just another meeting. You see, we get, we get that mentality in Pentecostal churches where we we see and experience so much and so on. So it's a matter of a decision. So let's all decide that this won't just be another ordinary meeting. Uh, but let it be extraordinary, not because I'm here, but because the Holy Spirit wants to do something in people's lives. And so it's got nothing to do with me, but it has everything to do with the Holy Spirit and our attitudes towards the Holy Spirit. And so let's have that kind of a switched on attitude this morning where we have a, a real sense of direction real sense of purpose and our purpose today is to touch God and to allow God to touch us and impart something to us now it's not a matter of emotionalism it's not a matter of feeling something it's a matter of you making a decision that you're going to have a meeting this morning with the Holy Spirit now you may feel something you may not if it's only feeling well, you can get a good feeling by seeing a good movie. Or you can get a good feeling by doing other things. But it's not by feeling. It's by faith. And faith is not dependent upon feeling. See? I want you to realize that faith does not depend upon feeling. If it depended upon feeling, well then... Uh, you wouldn't have results all the time. But you can have results all the time through sheer faith in God's Word, without feeling, without emotion. So it's not a matter of emotion, it's not a matter of feeling, it's a matter of your faith in God and your faith in God's promises. See, and God has promised I am the Lord that heals you. You can read in the Bible, I am the Lord who heals you. If you're sick, well then be healed. Not a matter of whether you feel healed or whether you feel anything at all. It's a matter of saying, well, God said it. That settles it. You are a Christian this morning because you believed God. You didn't see Jesus die for you on the cross. You didn't see him rise from the dead. But you know that he did. And that's faith, because you never saw it. You never felt anything about it. So just have faith in God, all right? Have faith in God. Whatever you came for this morning, receive it. If you came for healing, well then believe the promises of God. What did God say? He said, I am the Lord who heals you. Now, he never would have said it if he didn't believe it. And if he didn't mean it. He believes it himself. So, I am the Lord who healed you. Everybody say that out loud. I am the Lord who healed you. Do you believe that now? If you believe it, then be healed. He said, I am the Lord who healed you. If you want to, to have the baptism with the Holy Spirit, is that only for certain people, like pastors and leaders of churches and and uh, uh, leaders of home fellowship groups and so forth or does he want to fill you and everybody else with his Holy Spirit God has no favorites you're important to God say I am important to God now you make God important to you and believe him trust his word he won't fail you he said he wouldn't fail you he said I will never leave you nor forsake you. Never. Now what do you mean when he said never? He meant never. You can't make anything else out of that, can you? Never's never. He said, I will never leave you. All right? If he will never leave you, that means he's with you now. If he said he would never leave you, he said, I'll never leave you, Frank Houston. Well, when I gave my life to Jesus, I was 18. And now I'm about 82 or 80 something. 80 or whatever it is. And it'll be the same when I'm 92 if I live that long. It's always the same. He said, I will never leave you. Say never. Yeah. Well, you can't make anything else out of that except that it means never. 
It goes on and on and on. How old are you, son? Ten. How old are you? Eight. Ten, eight. I'm eight too, but it's eighty-two. I wonder what you look like when you're eighty-two. No hair. Whole wrinkled face. Eighty-two. Do you think you might live till you're eighty-two? What do you say? Probably. I think you're right. What about you? Do you think you'll live till you're eighty-two? I wonder what you look like then. Tall, fat, big, strong, healthy, happy. Ah, when is your birthday? Third of May. What's the date now? Twelfth of You had your birthday. Oh, you can't have another one till next year now. <laughs> when is your birthday? Isn't that amazing? And I don't even have any money. Not too many lollies. All right, what are we doing now? Where are we at? I know, but which end are we going to start? Up here or start here? All right, do you both want to sit down or do you want to keep standing? Sit if you want to or stand, whichever you like. I'm not going to be long because I'm going to go through here like a fire. I'm going to go through here. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't take a long prayer. It doesn't take a lot of fuss. As you know, I'm just going to go down and pray for you very quickly. And uh, so don't get impatient. I'm not going to take long. All right. What's your name? What? Can you say it louder? Oh, Matthew. And then I got a, I got a, 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 a little, my son. I got my son, his son's name is Matthew. Lord Jesus, bless Matthew in the name of Jesus. What's your name? Nathan. I've got a nephew called Nathan. Nathan. Bless Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, bless him in the name of Jesus. Yes, God, bless this man of God in the name of Jesus. Speak in Jesus' name. Yes, receive from God now. In the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh Lord. Bless you. In the name of Jesus. Oh God. Come upon him. In the name of Jesus. Thank you Lord. Receive from the Lord. Now when I touch you. You receive from something from the Lord. Get ready for it. Yes. Jesus. Confidence. So, 
Uh, that, um, that song uh, uh, makes me feel very nostalgic because that's the song uh, that really sparked a great revival a few years ago in, in um, up in Toronto, and uh, and uh, and it was known as the Toronto Blessing. Uh, how many? Anybody remember uh, when that occurred uh, some years ago? And uh, Hazel, my late wife, and I uh, felt led of the Lord to go up to Toronto uh, and. Um, participate in that great outpouring of the Holy Spirit that occurred. Did you get up there for that? And uh, <clears throat> people went from all over the world without anybody inviting them. People, Christians from all over the world flew to Toronto in Canada because the news of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit occurred and Christians everywhere. And uh, I got invited up there uh, by uh, some of the, the leaders of that uh, movement of the Spirit of God and and it was truly remarkable you know there was a, such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that moved all over Canada from Toronto and right down into the United States of America in churches all over the place and uh, and so I, I was invited to go up to Toronto uh, to take part and to take some of the meetings in that great outpouring of the Holy Spirit so I feel quite nostalgic. Uh, I think we might sing it in a couple of minutes, and we might sing it again. Uh, not that you can get much out of nostalgia, uh, but, you know, uh, memory can be a very good thing because it can stir something in you uh, and, you know, create desire, which is, is, is a step into something that God uh, will fulfill in your life. And uh, so I think it's not without significance to me this morning that uh, that we sang uh, that uh, coin. We might sing it another couple of times and uh, enter into it. And uh, you know, when we finish singing it a couple of times, why don't we just lift our hands and, and, and ourselves personally invite the Holy Spirit to visit us again? You know, young men and young women in that great revival in Toronto, uh, it was significant. The number did you go up to that? No, but it was significant. The number of young people that got slain by the Holy Spirit, you know, been knocked to the floor, and the power of God. And um, uh, Hazel, my, my late wife and I, we went up there because we were invited to go up and take part in some of the great meetings of that day. And, and uh, you want to keep praying in your prayer meetings and in your own personal life. Pray that God will revive us again. You know, that revival will come to our land uh, and uh, to our cities and our towns uh, and that God will do a new thing. Because the great thing about revival is a whole horde, if I may use that rather common expression, a whole horde of new people get swept into the kingdom of God who otherwise wouldn't be touched. But they get swept in and during that um, great revival in Toronto, uh, it swept right across the world, all over Canada, all over America, right away across into England, tremendous movements of the Holy Spirit in the British Isles, England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales uh, were smitten by it, all over New Zealand, they had a very big movement of it in New Zealand. and. Uh, we ought to pray and believe God for another outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, because uh, the people that very often get, get uh, smitten by the Holy Spirit are young people and thousands, tens of thousands of people all over the world uh, were, if you added them all up, tens of thousands were swept into the kingdom of God as a result of that initial outpouring of the Spirit of God and it just occurred one Sunday in a church in Toronto uh, when uh, they had been having special prayer meetings and the power of God came upon the pastor and, and the pastor was slain in front of everybody uh, and that's the way the revival started he, and I met that man, I don't know if you met him but uh, he was just a very lovely man and, and actually a very shy person and the last man that you would ever think would fall down in front of his congregation. But the power of God came so mightily upon him, he was slain. Some people thought he'd had a heart attack. 
but he had a heart attack of a different kind. His heart was affected by the Holy Ghost and, and, and started a movement that swept the whole world, all over the world, as a result of that one meeting. And a meeting that usually lasted an hour and a half went for over eight hours or so, non-stop. It was such a movement of the Holy Spirit. And you ought to pray for revival, you know, you ought to keep praying that God will revive the church around the world. Revive the church in your own city and, and revive your own heart. Quicken your own heart. Make, make it come alive on the inside and start appreciating the blessing of God and the movement of the Spirit of God. And, uh, and uh, you can't force these things to happen, but you can pray for them to happen. You can believe in your heart for, for them to happen that God will revive and you know you should make a prayer of yours and you should uh, revive us again O oh Lord you know you should pray that prayer you know often revive us again revive means brought alive if somebody dies and you revive them they've come from the dead and that's where they got the word revival from the word revival came from revive uh, waken and quicken the dead bring them alive and you know the churches are full of dead people not physically dead but spiritually dead and the church around the world needs another awakening another revival another outpouring of the Holy Ghost glory to God I'm getting excited here you know and I'm thinking about what should happen in this city in this town if, 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 I'm thinking too brother oh yes yeah. and, and you know and what could happen yeah. this building wouldn't be big enough for a revival but it would be a great thing if you had to put extra chairs in the aisles and you've got a very wide aisle it could do a lot narrower than this oh, yeah. and still get up and down and if you had to put chairs in because of the people coming to see what's happening yeah. the revival is uh, uh, it's just a, an addition to the word revive means made alive or quickened brought to life revival and uh, you should pray in your private prayers. Pray that the Lord will give you a revival personally. And that if you get revived, somebody around you is going to get revived. You know what I mean? If the pastor gets revived, well then somebody around him is going to get revived. If I get revived, somebody, if this boy here on the end gets a revival in his heart, he might end up being a young preacher, a young evangelist, preaching the gospel. He wouldn't be the, how old he is then? 14. Well, many a boy of 14 has had a revival, which reminds me, I, <coughs> I had a, <coughs> pardon me, I had a boy in my church in New Zealand, a town in New Zealand, years and years ago, and he was 14. This is what reminds me of, and I think of him. And his name was Donald Hennessy. What an Irish name. Donald Hennessy. We used to call him Don. Don Hennessy. He was 14 years of age, and I was pastoring a church. And all we had in the congregation was about 28 people. And this boy, Don, had a revival in his heart. And as a result of that, you wouldn't believe what happened. All the people that were coming to know Jesus as a result of one 14-year-old boy having a revival, Jesus coming and touching his heart and setting a fire burning in his heart. Oh, yeah, revive our hearts. Yeah, everybody say, close your eyes and say, and pray this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you today that you are the God of revival. I ask you now, grant to me, O Lord, revival. Revive my heart, O God. Give me an increasing love for Jesus. Do it now, Lord. I receive, and I bless your holy name. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a clap. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now lift your hands to God. Now with a loud voice, praise Him. Come on. Hallelujah. Hey, pop, 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 pop,
an expectant heart. If you expect nothing, that's what you get, nothing. If you expect a, a revival and believe for it and pray for it and work for it, that's exactly what you'll have, you know. And, uh, you know, you could, you could help double the congregation here if every one person would get so touched by God, you'd try until you succeeded in getting one person to come to church, you know. But you see, we give up trying. We don't. We don't try. We go along, and we, we never think that maybe there was a neighbour somewhere who uh, would love to go to church, but nobody ever asked them. You know, and uh, you, it's amazing what you can do when you start trying. What is it? Oh, you know. Oh, they won't come. Nobody ever comes. Well, with that attitude, nobody ever will. You know. Maybe some of you came to church because in the first place somebody bought you. I don't know. But it's amazing how many, I don't know what the population is around here. 60,000 people. You can't tell me that there's 60,000 Christians out there <laughs> or there's 60,000 people that go to church. The reality is that most people don't go to church. The great majority of people don't go to church. They used to, many, many, many years ago, people always went to church on Sunday. But now, we have a secular society, and people don't go to church. And that's why we have so much trouble in the world. When people have God, they become a powerhouse and a fortress against the enemy. And, uh, uh, you know, you keep believing God for better things, bigger things, and become active in helping people to find the answer. The world is in for a tremendous shock. Jesus is going to come suddenly. I want you to remember that. The Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye. That doesn't mean the blinking of an eye. The twinkling of an eye is uh, a, an a occurrence right away deep in the, in the eyeball of the eye. It's so fast that it can't be detected by... Uh, another human eye looking at it. But this young man is looking at me now, but he, he, he could have a twinkling of an eye, and his eye wouldn't move. But the inner eye can move so fast. You know how a camera will click? Well, much, much quicker than that. And it's called the twinkling of an eye. That quickly, Jesus is going to come suddenly. And uh, when he comes, multitudes will not be prepared for him. Won't be prepared for him. They won't. They won't be prepared 
Many of them don't even know that he is coming. Never heard of it. Never heard that Jesus is going to suddenly, the Bible says, appear in the clouds of the sky and come back to the earth suddenly. And when he comes, millions will not be prepared for him. On the other hand, there will be some millions that are prepared for him, like you, uh, ready for the coming of the Lord. Won't that be wonderful when he comes? Oh, whoopee! Glory to God. Amen.